welcome everybody. So I am Dr. Chris Gilbert. I'm a physician and author. Everybody hears me. And I'm going to talk today about how to cure physical illness by addressing the emotional and behavioral issues that create physical illness. And I'm Dr. Eric Hasseltine, a neuroscientist who will explain the hard science underneath the success of Dr. Gilbert's techniques. <laughs> That's interesting. So first, I'm going to tell you a story. And that's the story of Abigail, who has pain in her throat. She has been having this pain for about six months. She has seen numerous physicians, an internal medicine physician who gave a blood test. Everything was normal, looked at her throat. Everything looked normal. And she, see, she saw an ENT specialist who put a scope down her throat to look at her vocal cords, and everything was normal. She saw a gastroenterologist who put a, an, endo, an endoscope and looked at her esophagus and stomach. Everything was normal. She, she had a CT scan, MRI. Nobody could see anything. So finally, they referred her to a psychiatrist who gave her uh, an anti-anxiety medication. The anti-anxiety medication worked a little bit, but she still had a throat pain. And the anti-anxiety medication made her dizzy and drowsy, and she decided to stop, and then she came to see me. So I treated her by asking two key questions. The first question is, what happened just before the throat pain started. And the second question is, if your throat had a voice, and especially if the pain had a voice, what would it say? So the answer to the first question was that just before the throat pain started, her husband told her that he had been having an affair. But, but she had nothing to worry about. The affair was over. He really, really loved her. And everything will be just like it was before. No problem. So part of her said, OK, maybe yeah, he still loves me. Everything is good, and I should not worry, right? But Another part of her was in fury. She was so angry. How could he do this to me? How? He, I thought he really loved me, and he had an affair on me. And she became so frustrated and angry. And there was also sadness, so many emotions that stayed bottled in, couldn't go anywhere. So they were two parts of her. As you, can, as you can see here, the part of her that was so angry and but was, had to be bottled in, couldn't go anywhere, and the other part of her that had to smile and be pleasant to everybody socially, because it's not acceptable to just be ang to walk and, and be angry all the time. And those two forces inside of her worked on her vocal cords and on her throat. There were two types of muscles, one type of muscle that really wanted to express the anger and scream, and the other type of muscle that wanted to prevent her from doing this. And that tug of war created the pain, that throat pain that she had had for six months that nobody can cure. So the way to cure it was to give her throat a voice. If her throat had a voice, that was my second question, what would it say? And that throat really needed to express her anger, but in a very safe way. I had her express the anger in my office. And the more she expressed it, and the more she expressed that tug of war between those two parts of her, the more the pain in her throat decreased. So we've all heard the expression, let off steam. 
Hello? Yes. Oh, yes. We've all heard the expression, let off steam, get it off my chest. Where does that come from? Well, a friend of mine, Dr. Matthew Lieberman up the road here at UCLA, has been putting people's heads in super magnets and performing what's called the functional magnetic resonance imaging, which looks at the physiologic activity in the brain while we are perceiving, thinking, and behaving. So you can get under the hood and see what the engine is doing. And what he found is he had two groups of patients or subjects. One who had strong emotions that did not express them, and the other that did express them. And what he found is that a, a structure in the brain called the amygdala, you may have heard about, in a part of the limbic system, and it is thought to be involved heavily in experience of fear and anger. Just the act of vocalizing a strong emotion immediately lessened the activity in the amygdala. And this kind of correlates with our own subjective experience that getting it off our shelf in and of itself is therapeutic, and it helps explain why Abigail was helped by Dr. Chris's technique. Now, not only did I have her scream and express her anger, I put a lot of pillows on my examination table, and I had her beat those pillows up just really, really expressing the anger out safely because she didn't direct the anger at anybody, but she, it, it would get out. The problem is that a little bit after her husband had an other affair that she found about, and then the throat pain came back. And then we did some more screaming and beating up pillows, but ultimately, ultimately, she had to decide whether to quit and to leave the relationship. So Abigail was cured by getting it out. Getting it on. And getting it over. Now, in addition to being a neuroscientist, in my checkered past, I was a shrink and saw patients at the South Bay Center for Counseling for seven years. And a lot of that work was couples counseling. And there are cases when, if the core problem is a husband who can't remain faithful, there's really only one solution, and that's to leave. But that's not the first option that we psychotherapists like to pursue. We like to try to engage to get the couple to fix it. But in either case, whether you quit or get over the problems in the relationship another way, you have to get over the core underlying driver of stress in order to cure the disease. So the bottom line is that we achieve lasting cures versus temporary fixes by addressing the emotional and behavioral root causes of the majority of physical illnesses. And in this talk today, we're going to explain the connection between emotions and disease, and Eric is going to explain this. Then I'm going to talk about why conventional medicine does not address this important connection. And then I'm going to give you some example of techniques that I use. We'll start with a monologue, like giving the body a voice, giving your stomach a voice, for example. And then I'm going to continue by explaining how I can create a dialogue between two parts of the body, or between the mind and the body part, for example, the back. Then I'm going to describe my inner group therapy where different body parts can have a voice. And ultimately we found a way to cure the patient by giving all those body parts a voice. And then ultimately at the end will be the fun part where I'm going to explain an interaction between a body part of one person and another body part of another person. And what more fun can it be uh, than addressing the genitals? When a man's genitals talks to a woman's genitals, what can happen? The end is going to be a little X-rated, but it's going to be fun. 
first, let's talk about the relationship between emotions, stress, and disease. So if we go back to Abigail's case and drill down under the hood and say what was going on in her body that caused the stress to produce real physical symptoms, we start with a study that Kaiser Hospital did that covered several decades. And what they found is when they examined the ultimate reason why, patients came to see their primary care doctors in the system. 80% of the time, it was due to a physical symptom that ultimately had an emotional or behavioral cause. Here you see work stress or other kinds of stressors, which can lead to overeating. We all sometimes self-medicate with food. I uh, went back and had some of those yummy pastries to uh, get my blood sugar up and calm down a little bit. And then there's other kinds of substance abuse, as uh, we're going to go into later, the opioid epidemic, for example. You can trace to a lot of emotional stress and bottled up feelings. But how exactly is it that this happens? Well, one way of looking at it is that we bottle these feelings up, creating an internal conflict that Dr. Chris uh, talked about. And how does that work? Well, suppressing emotions creates this inner conflict, and we create a war inside of ourselves. And the simple analogy to that is a lot of heat and friction is gen generated whenever there is conflict and tension. But more fundamentally, when we have a conflict that's unresolved, we have uncertainty. And humans really, really don't like unpredictability and uncertainty. It evokes a fear response, which in turn evokes a response that's been in our brain and those of our ancestors for millions of years called the fight or flight reflex. Some of you probably heard of this, that when presented with a threat, our bodies get ready. We pump adrenaline and noradrenaline into our system to get our muscles and blood vessels ready to run or fight. Also, in order to protect against damage to our bodies, we secrete a substance called cortisol. It's also known as a steroid. And this constant uh, over-secretion of these hormones has a number of damaging effects. One of them is that with adrenaline and noradrenaline, our muscles are more prone to be hyper-excitable, get tense, and in many cases, spasm. A lot of back pain, for instance, is caused by this. The cortisol has another insidious, extremely damaging effect, and that's the effect on the immune system. Here I show a chart, and I'm not going to go through every one of these, but I think it's safe to say that there isn't an organ in your body that isn't damaged by stress. And in particular, when something happens and you go to the doctor, it's often because this constant stress has put pressure on the weakest part of your body, and it gave first. Could be your back, could be your stomach, could be headaches, could be lots of different things. But I want to dwell for a moment on the immune system, because hot off the press research is starting to show just how incredibly important stress-induced damage to the immune system is. On the one hand, when we weaken the immune system with over-secretion of cortisol, we decrease its ability to fight bad cells, which could be bacteria or viruses, on the one hand, or cancer cells on the other. It turns out that all of us are constantly spawning off mutated cells, and our immune system sees those and kills them before they get bad. The same is true, of course, with infection. When we have stress, and when we have over-secretion of cortisol, our immune system is weakened, and we're much more likely to get infection and cancer. So that's one answer. But the other one is a little counterintuitive. The damage to the immune system also damages the ability of the immune system to regulate and differentiate healthy tissue from not healthy tissue. How many of you have heard of autoimmune disease? Okay, arthritis, colitis, psoriasis, asthma. These are leading examples of autoimmune disease. And what happens with autoimmune disease is inflammation. And we're just starting to learn that inflammation is a really, really bad actor. It used to be that doctors were heavily focused on lipids and cholesterol as a way to reduce stroke and cardiovascular disease. And they still are. 
But they're starting to realize that inflammation is even a greater. I don't know how many of you have heard your doctor say, I want to look at your C-reactive protein to see how much of a risk you are for a stroke or heart attack. So inflammation is directly involved in cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. But we're also finding out that inflammation is a leading cause of mental illness. It's a fascinating subject, but it turns out that depression and anxiety, one of the reasons that they are so highly correlated with heart disease and stroke is that the common culprit is inflammation. So why does conventional medicine often fail? Well, because studies show that only 3% of primary care physicians address the emotional problems and the stress that cause the disease. And why is that? Well, because physicians are not trained to address those emotional problems. They are trained to address the physical issue, give a pill, and send the patient in their way. And what the patient wants, usually, is just a quick fix. Want to go in, see the physician, and be out with a pill. What the physician wants is a very quick office visit, because if the physician starts asking the emotional problem that is the root cause, then it's going to be a much longer office visit, like one hour and maybe more. And the physician is not going to be paid for that time. So the physician will want a quick fix, too, to be paid for just a five minutes of his visit. And the pharmacist is going to be really happy with a prescription, especially nowadays when prescription pills are so expensive. So everything will be, everybody will be happy. There is going to be no incentive for a longer office visit or to find out what the origin, the emotional origin was. And the problem with drugs, and then eventually surgery, or and even some tests, is that they have dangerous side effects. For example, if you do a CT scan with iodine as a contrast, that can be kidney toxic. You've got to know that you have to drink a lot of water right after a CT scan with uh, iodine contrast. Otherwise, it's toxic, but drugs, uh, like anti-inflammatories, for example, can be toxic for the stomach and give stomach ulcers or inflammation. Muscle relaxants also can give drowsiness, dizziness, and make you more prone to fall if, if you walk. Also, there is a big opioid crisis in this country where when people are in pain, Physicians prescribe opioids, which are very effective, but it creates an addiction. We need more and more doses, a higher and higher dose, to get the same effect. And the problem is that when people, once people are addicted, they cannot stop anymore. Because if they stop, then they will be in intense pain and that pain is not going to be the original pain. It's going to be the pain because of withdrawal from medication. It's going to be an intense physical pain in the whole body telling them that they really need that drug. So a lot of side effects. And when there are a lot of drugs, it, it increases increases the odds of medical mistakes. Now, do you guys know how many medical mistakes there are per year in the United States? Give me one number. Million. 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 We have a million. <laughs> Very close. Cool. So I hear more. <laughs> 1.3 million cases of medical mistakes per year in the United States. And this is going to kill 400,000 people per year in the United States because of a medical mistake. It could be because the physician will, do the, will make the wrong diagnosis. Or it's going to be maybe he gives the right prescription, but at the wrong dose. Or it could be the wrong medication. Or it could be that the pharmacist is going to give 
the wrong prescription, something that sounds alike but is not alike, or the pharmacist is going to give the right prescription at the wrong dose, something that is not written on the prescription pad. So my advice to all of you, whenever you get your prescription medicine from the pharmacist, always check that the name of your medication is the name that your physician gave you and that the dose is really the dose that you're supposed to take. You would be surprised of the amount of mistakes that can be. So, wouldn't it be great if there are a way to get at the core underlying cause of disease and cure it quickly with no side effects and no medical mistakes? Well, there it is. <laughs> that is a picture that Eric took. And we wanted to put it at the front on the front cover of our book, The Listening Cure. But somehow our publisher didn't like it, so didn't use it. But now I'm going to explain some of the techniques that can be used for listening to the body and finding what the origin of the problem is. We need to be in tune with our body. And Ideally, if our body had a voice, what would it say? And I'm going to do a little exercise with you right now, with us together, and we're going to try to give our stomach a voice. So we'll take a couple of deep breaths. And another one. and tune into your stomach. And if your stomach had a voice, what would it say? For example, if my stomach had a voice, I would say, mm, I'm really hungry, but I'm very tense because I'm giving a presentation. I've got knots in me. So maybe I shouldn't eat, but I'm still feeling really empty. Eric, if your stomach had a voice, what would it say? Can't hear. <laughs> I ate too many chocolate chip pancakes at that pancake house down the hill, and I'm bursting. It, anybody, anybody, if your stomach had a voice, what would it say? <laughs> there you go. I'm like, I'm like some of the days where I suffer from uh, indigestion. Today, I'm feeling wonderful. Feeling wonderful. Yeah. She's feeling wonderful. Anybody? If your stomach had a voice, what would it say? More. Oh, more. <laughs> Excellent. Anybody else? Hmm? So now there are some people that have some genius ideas about what their stomach would say. <laughs> And Eric is going to comment on that. <laughs> There's something I want you to notice in this slide. I hope we haven't disturbed your sleep or your appetite. <laughs> what don't you see in this picture? Yeah, you don't see that. You also don't see the person's head. Do you think that's by accident? Do you think maybe this thing was cropped so that you couldn't tell who this person was because they didn't want to like get fired or whatever? So what we have here is an anonymization that by posting it this way, this person has gone from me, who you'd recognize from the head up, to not me, this new character who has lots of, shall we say, gut feelings. <laughs> so let me dwell on that a little bit as a psychologist. I think to uh, give a context for this, the first point is that our minds, which are responsible for navigating us to a doctor, for example, aren't always aware of what's going on in the body. And I just want to give you a little experience of that. I want all of you to be conscious right now, in this moment, of the pressure of your butt on your chair. Okay, can you feel it? Can you feel that pressure? Now, Einstein would say, you're not pressing on the chair. The chair is accelerating up against you. But in either case, you feel something, right? Now, 
I want you to do another experiment. I all want you to close your left eye and take your right eye and move it right over to this thing here called your nose. Notice, you can see your nose. Before I brought it up, was any of you looking at your nose? No. So, if something could be as plain as the nose on your face, you'd miss it. Right? Right. Well, that's the point. We're all busy focusing on something. Our brains can only process one piece of information at a time. If you're a male like me, less so. So, because our brains have this soda straw through which we look at the world, when something's outside of that soda straw, we don't see it. And that includes our body. But there's a deeper psychological reason why. We have what Freud called, and he was wrong about a lot of things, but about some things he was dead on. And one of those is defense mechanisms. It turns out, for a very practical psychological reason, for evolutionary purposes, we don't like to feel unpleasant feelings. We don't like to know how flawed we are as human beings. So unconsciously, we have these mechanisms that tune those things out. Why? They would distract us. Two, and this is very important, if we constantly had self-doubt and self-introspection, we would not look confident to other, uh, say, for example, in my case, a female, and you'd never be able to attract a mate. So there are very good evolutionary reasons why we repress. We don't just ignore, but we actively repress the sensations that are coming out of our body. Recognizing this, a spin-off of Freudian psychology called Jungian psychology then evolved into something called Gestalt psychology. Some of you may have heard about this. In Gestalt psychology psychotherapy, they have learned that one way to short-circuit in very quick order the defense mechanisms and get down to the core unpleasant feelings that are there and driving the problem is a very simple technique. You go from, with the patient being me, to not me. Just like the big belly guy in the video. And how does this work? Well, by analogy, our brains automatically put up walls to defend me. But if it's not me, they don't. So the key to getting through to someone is to drive through that not me gap. And that is exactly what Dr. Chris does. So now, let's take another example, and let's go to a dialogue. And I'm going to take the example of Brian. Brian is an accountant, and he has to stay at work for long periods of time, sitting down, and he's complaining of back pain. So what is happening to Brian? Well, there is his mind that you see here that is telling him, you have to stay at work and you've got to stay sitting down. Even though it's a lot of work, it's a lot of stress, and I know you probably need to get up, but you cannot get up because you've got so much work to do. And I want you to finish that work before you get up. And the back, Brian's back says, but I need to stretch. I cannot stay for eight hours nonstop sitting down. I need to get up, I need to walk, I need to do lots of stretching, and I, I cannot do what you're asking me to do. And the mind says, but yes, I want you to do that. And it creates like a fight, an inside fight inside of him. Where you see the brain here, with a boxing glove, the brain has a shape of a boxing glove, trying to make the back stay sitting in one place for long periods of time. And the back has boxing gloves too and wants to just fight this mind and says, no, 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 I really, really need to move. And this tug of war and also the fact that the back needs to move creates this back pain. And what is the mind going to do? The mind is going to say, let me take this body and get him to the doctor so that we can get pills to, to cure this pain. But really, what is the pain pill going to do? It's going to be a band-aid in a way because it's not going to solve the problem that the, that the back needs to move. 
So the band-aid, the, the pain pill is going to work just for short term, it's going temporary. What the back really needs is stretching and going to the gym and doing physical movements every morning and taking breaks every hour or every two hours to move. The thing is that we are married to our body and our body has needs that we don't take into account. Any marriage, you can say, oh, it's okay, I'll get a divorce, no problem. But in this case, you can't say, buddy, I don't want you anymore. Go away, I'm going to get a younger body. That's going to be so much better. It doesn't work this way. We can't divorce, we can't have a divorce between our mind and our body. So we've got to make the best of it and keep the mind happy and keep the body happy by addressing its needs. Talking about needs of every single part of our body, here's an example of an inner group therapy with Mary, and Mary is overweight. And when she comes to see me, I try to ask her to give several body parts a voice. So the way it works is that you can give your stomach a voice, and then you can give your heart a voice, and then you can give your hand a voice, and then you can give your brain a voice, and then you can give your back a voice, and then your lungs a voice. If you focus, really, every single organ will have a voice to be expressed. And then afterwards, I ask the person to find uh, their inner mediator, which is the, a part of themselves that is going to be neutral and is going to be aware of each body part's needs and find a solution that will, be, that will make every body part happy and compromises that will work for every body part. So in the case of Mary, I ask her to give her mouth a voice. So her mouth says, oh, I love those donuts and, and the cheesecake mm, and salty food and crackers oh, and deep fried food that tastes so good. And then I give the stomach a voice. The stomach says, yeah, it tastes good, but it's heavy on me and but also it relaxes me. When there's food inside of me, I have much less anxiety. I feel better. And then the bowel had a voice. And the bowel said, oh, the food and the sugar give me so much gas. I feel so bloated. Oh, it's, it's like I, I, have to, I have to pass gas so much and, and, and those beans and the, oh, it's painful, so much gas. And then the back have a, has a voice and says, oh, but those heavy pounds, I've got 50 pounds on me that are so heavy and all this food is going to get again on top of this and it's going to be even more painful for, for me. And then the knees will have a voice and will say, it's, I echo, we echo the back. It's too painful, it's too much. Our cartilages are against each other because of all this weight. So we really need to lose weight because otherwise it's too painful. And the lungs will have a voice. And the lungs will say, we're short of breath because of all this extra weight. It's hard to breathe. So it's painful, it's too much weight. So then I ask, the patient to create an inner mediator. So again, the inner mediator is a part of them, and I will choose another place, like maybe, maybe here, that will look at the big picture, all those organs that said what they were feeling, and have a neutral point of view and maybe find a solution so that 
neutral mediator is going to say, you know, the, the back and the knees and the lungs and the bowel, they are painful, they're suffering, it's not good for them. The only one that really has pleasure is the mouth. The mouth clearly enjoyed all this. But the brain, like the mind and the, and the stomach, clearly said that it was just an anti-anxiety fix, that really the original problem was anxiety and that the food was calming down this anxiety. So is there another way that all those organs that the mouth could be somewhat happy, maybe we, she can compromise, and, but the, the mind and the stomach will be happy with a lesser calorie kind of food with just salads and lots of cucumbers and tomatoes that will make the stomach eats still big amounts to relax him, but will not make Mary gain weight. And ultimately, so that would be, that was the solution that Mary chose, but ultimately we asked to, we did ask her why there was so, stress, so much stress. And it uh, turned out that she had a lot of stress at her work and a lot of stress at home because she was arguing all the time with her husband. And at one point, she had to make a decision whether to stay or to leave. But now let's talk about something much more fun, which is a body-to-body -body interaction. In the case of a couple, Chloe and Joe were married uh, couple years before they came to see me. And Chloe was always coming to see me with bronchitis. And she was sick, and then Joe got sick afterwards, and then I would give them antibiotics, and then she would get sick again, and then Joe got the same bug, and then I would cure them again, and then they would start again. And at one point, I saw that they were depressed and fatigued and something was wrong. So I asked the question, what is wrong? And they kind of said, when I asked a little bit more questions, that they had no sexual life. And they had been married only for two years and they were young. And why was that? And they didn't really want to talk about it. There were a lot of taboos. And so what I did, I said, what about we give your genitals a voice? So I said to Joe, it's not going to be you talking. It's going to be your penis. And I told Chloe, it's not going to be you talking. It's going to be your clitoris and your vagina. And what came out of this was very interesting. It was that Joe's penis said, well, I, I don't feel good. I'm married to my beautiful wife, and I sleep next to her every night. But I can't have any action, and I really need sex. I mean, I'm young. I, I, I cannot do without sex. I need sex. And by giving Chloe, you, you see here, we, we, di we didn't want to do, be too X-rated, so we chose a banana and <laughs> an oyster. <laughs> and the oyster said, it was not Chloe, it was just the oyster, said, uh, for the clitoris, for example, she said, oh, he doesn't do foreplay. He doesn't touch me the way I like. I, when it's too much pressure, it hurts. And when it, there is too little pressure, I, I don't feel anything. And then her vagina said, but he gets inside of me way too fast and it hurts. And he goes too fast in and out and it hurts. If he goes too fast in out, then uh, it hurts. And if he goes too slowly, then I don't feel anything. And I don't want sex anymore because he doesn't have the right touch. 
So by doing this dialogue, we got them interested in each other, where Joe's penis said, well, I'm ready to explore and I'm ready to do experiments with you. Maybe we can try new things and I'll do exactly what you want, what you like. And, and, and she said, yes, well, that sounds really good. Let's, let's practice. And they left my office hand in hand. And for some reason, the following year, they had much less bronchitis, actually. I, I saw them just once instead of like once a month. They were much less sick, much less fatigued, and uh, they felt so much better. So in conclusion, we showed you that emotional and behavioral problems underlie many, if not most, physical illnesses. And that conventional medicine does not adequately address those deep problems. And using Dr. Chris's techniques of giving the body a voice, we can get to the root cause of the problem and take care of it or medicine fails. And we can do it quickly, inexpensively, and without side effects or medical mistakes. So, if you could listen to your body, what, what would, would it say? say? <laughs> Thank you. If you, if you well, uh, are there any questions? Yes, let's uh, get the microphone. Can we, uh, oh, here, I'll just take Maybe it. I could project without a microphone. Okay, go ahead. And I'll repeat the question. Yes, question. Since in college, I acted and they taught us that. Um, my information may be wrong because I'm retired over 15 years, but your slide said that only about 3% of DPs or whatever um, treat the underlying psychological issues. As of when I retired, Valium was being prescribed by GPs for damn near everything. And that's more than 3%. And Valium treats stuff like this. Uh, well, uh, first of all, the question was, the 3% number can't be right, because when he was in position, everyone was prescribing Valium like it was candy. Yes. Um, so I, I'll take that first and say, well, you're the actual MD. <laughs> it's, it is a quick fix. Valium is a quick fix. But what I want to underline is that what was the emotional problem? It needs to get out. The person needs to express it and find a solution to the emotional problem. Because keeping emotions inside is not going to help. And Valium will just be a band-aid. It will not fix that. But it will be one of the quick fixes that so many people use. And I want to, as a psychologist, comment on that, too. There's an old saying, how many light bulbs does it take to, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Yeah. One. But that light bulb really has to want to change. <laughs> and so if you're taking Valium and you reduce the symptoms, your motivation to cure the underlying emotional problem that drove your symptoms in the first place is removed. So it's an enabling. So it not only doesn't cure the core problem, but I would maintain it makes it worse. Other questions? Yes. Uh, you have indicated earlier that there are 400,000 uh, uh, deaths uh, per year because of uh, medical errors. Uh, we have, an, on the average, I think something like 5 million deaths. That means that 10% of our deaths in the country are because of medical errors. Now, of those 400,000, how many are because of a wrong diagnosis or how many are because uh, 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 med or surgical errors? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the question was, of the 400,000 deaths, how many are due to wrong diagnosis, surgical error, or other causes? Um, the data that we saw did not rack and stack the numbers, but it said the number one cause was misdiagnosis, by far. So the exact numbers, I don't know. Yes, over there. 
where do uh, pilot yoga, meditation, and other exercises fit into this, or do they fit at all? So the question was, where does Pilates, meditation, yoga, and other exercises fit into this? It fits very well. And that's a way to calm the body down, <laughs> to relax. And for some people, it is the way for them to address the emotional issue. Some other people will need more violent, I would say, physical exercise, like hitting a ball or hitting like a tennis ball or a golf ball. Uh, so it depends on every person. Some other people will want to write in a diary to express their feelings. Some other people will want to make drawings uh, of their feelings. Some other people will want to dance. Some other people, and maybe also you, will uh, want to sing also. Singing their emotions, creating uh, scores, creating lyrics to get the emotions out there. So those are all good tools where every person needs to find their own way to decrease their stress. But Pilates and meditation is very good too. Yeah. Well, thank you very much all for coming. Thank you.